Hello and welcome to Velina's Talk. This is the second season of the digital format and today's episode is focused on global power competition from the perspective of Australia. My name is Velina Chakarova and I'm the director of the Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy based in Vienna, Austria. My work includes research, consulting and lectures on the global system transformation and new strategy of uh, global actors. This podcast is produced in partnership with Bharat Vata, India's leading podcast on politics, policy and culture. So, as we know, the global system has never been as interconnected as it was demonstrated by the COVID-19 outbreak. But global affairs are also at an inflection point. An unexpected manifestation of the pandemic is the bifurcation of the global system in a way unseen since the Cold War. It begs the question, is the world witnessing the beginning of a new bipolar era of a global power competition or where are we headed to? My guest today is Major General Mick Ryan uh, from the Australian Army. Major General Mick Ryan has commanded at the Troop Squadron Regiment Task Force and Brigade levels over the past 30 years. His operational services include serving at East Timor, Iraq and Southern Afghanistan. Major General Ryan has a bachelor's degree in Asian studies from the University of New England and is a graduate of the Australian Defense Force School of Languages. He is distinguished graduate of the United States Marine Corps Command and Staff College and a graduate of the USMC School of Advanced War Fighting. In 2012, he graduated from the John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies with a master's in international public policy. And he has a long, lang lang uh, long uh, standing sorry, interest in military history and strategy, advanced technologies, organizational innovation, and adapt adaptation theory. He was inaugural president of the Defense Entrepreneurs Forum in Australia and is a member of the Military Writers Guild. And last but not least, he's also an author on the interface of military strategy, innovation, advanced technologies, as well as how institutions can develop their intellectual age. In February next year, his first book, War Transformed, will be published by USNI Books. General Ryan, welcome to this digital talk. Thanks, Felina. It's uh, terrific to be here with you. I look forward to our conversation. Before we actually focus on what your book is going to be about, I would like to uh, ask a direct question regarding Australia. How will Australia navigate between this emerging animosity, some call it strategic systemic rivalry, um, between the United States on the one side, long lasting traditional ally, and China, Australia's largest trading partner, so to say. How significant is actually uh, Australia's dependence on China in reality, in what concrete areas? I think it, it's important to state right up front that Australia is dependent on foreign capital full stop. I mean, we're a country that is re reliant on a, an external nervous system of international capital and, and foreign investment. And if, if you have a look at not just the equation when it comes to trade, and, and China is our largest trading partner, but when you look at the full equation of foreign investment, uh, countries like the United States, the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, Canada, Japan, are all really significant investors in Australia, indeed bigger investors in Australia than, than China is. So uh, our trade relationship with China is very important. Uh, but it's only part of the story when you look at Australia's uh, overseas relationships when it comes to economics and uh, our uh, ongoing need, as most countries do, to seek foreign investment in a range of industries and, and services. So they are our biggest uh, trading partner, but we have a lot of other economic partners as well who are very important to us. So it's more or less about a kind of um, having a large portfolio and you know not putting all eggs only in one basket, so to say, when it comes to investments and uh, uh, trading partners. But there is also the discussion about 
reconfiguration of supply chains following the mm. pandemic uh, uh, last year. Uh, what is the case um, in Australia? Does Australia consider a potential reconfiguration of supply chains? Mm. Yeah, I think like most countries, COVID-19 firstly demonstrated to us all just how fragile some of our supply chains were, whether it was with protective equipment for hospitals, uh, whether it was uh, vaccines uh, and certain other uh, manufacturers uh, and services. But it also showed that the world uh, trading environment is actually pretty resilient. Ships are still plying the oceans, carrying containers between countries. Uh, you know, countries like Australia is reliant on international trade and, and shipping. And that continued during COVID. So whilst okay. resilience in some services and, and trade goods has got a lot of attention. There's also a lot of good news stories, I think, in the resilience of, of many of the other areas of international trade, whether it's with energy um, and manufacturers and services that don't necessarily need physical movement between nations. So that's my first point. It's not all bad news. Uh, but the reality is most countries, I think, have been forced to reassess where things are coming from that they import. And it's not just looking at one country or, or another. It's just saying, well, what are the, what's the supply chain that we're reliant on for really important aspects uh, for our society, whether it's medicines, could well be fertilizers for growing things. Uh, it could well be energy, uh, oil or, or other sources of energy. Uh, and countries like Australia have gone, well, boy, a, a large proportion of uh, our precursors for fertiliser come from a certain country. A large proportion of precursors for medicines also might come from a certain country. Uh, once you know that, you can then make a decision, is that something that we're comfortable with or not? Um, for a lot of countries, they'll say, okay, that's fine. There's nothing we can do about it. Uh, but for others, they'll go, well, actually, we may want to diversify sources of uh, precursors or, or manufacturers or services. And we may want to uh, rely on a certain smaller group of countries for things like telecommunications goods uh, or defence defense supplies. And Australia has certainly over the last couple of years released and been very transparent about industry plans, about supporting Australian industry for shipbuilding, uh, more recently about sovereign missile capability and a range of other manufacturers to say, well, listen, we don't want to rely uh, too heavily on external sources. There are some things we need to be able to do and provide ourselves. We're also very lucky as a country, we, we produce enough food for about 75 million people in a country of 25. So uh, we also have a lot of resilience internally uh, that we're very fortunate about. And, you know, there's not a lot of countries in the world that are in that position. So it, it's a fairly complex uh, scenario. And, and it's not just about uh, a few things where one or two countries dominated supply. I, I think it's a bigger picture. Um, and we need to look across the board when it comes to trade manufacturers and, and services. Now, um, to put it mildly, the timing of our conversation could not be uh, better uh, regarding uh, the latest uh, geopolitical developments in the world. Uh, as we all know, Australia, the United Kingdom and the United States uh, have decided to deepen diplomatic security and defense cooperation, specifically in the Indo-Pacific uh, region. However, there are also other actors um, that are very, very active uh, in this region right now. On the one side, the European Union launched the Indo-Pacific strategy. India has been very, very active within the quadrilateral format together with the United States, Australia and Japan. So what is your take on this uh, new strategic partnership uh, between Australia and the United, uh, the United Kingdom and United States in the context of emerging uh, ad hoc uh, geopolitical actors constellations, will it have an impact on the Quad or on the transatlantic okay. alliance, also on the relationship with uh, European yeah. partners, and if uh, in what uh, sense? Um, I think the just announced AUKUS pact is designed to complement a range of uh, security and economic and historical relationships that Australia has with a range of countries. I mean, we have a long-standing defence alliance with the United States and New Zealand, ANZUS. We have a long-standing alliance uh, with the United Kingdom. Uh, we have terrific relationships with a range of regional partners. Indonesia is a very close uh, partner for Australia. Uh, we have a strategic cooperation agreement with Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, the Philippines. 
Korea, Japan, uh, India are, are all significant uh, relationships for our country. And indeed, of our top 10 economic relationships when it comes to investment and trade, nine are uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, but we shouldn't forget that uh, we also have a lot of relationships, very important ties to the EU and lots of different European countries. I think there's something like 45,000 Australians of Austrian descent. You know, so it's not to say in any way that uh, the EU or other Asian partners are more or less uh, important. It's, it's all about complementing a range of other very important relationships that we have with countries uh, and we'll continue to maintain that portfolio of different relationships. But they all matter. They're all very important. And you already mentioned some of uh, the other important par partners in the region. Uh, so uh, what special role, for instance, could Australia play in this uh, emerging quad formation with the United States um, and with uh, Japan, um, but also specifically with India. Do you see also um, new substance for the relations between Australia and India? Yeah, I mean, India is a, is a, um, a partner for Australia. I mean, we've had, we've had Australian officers go to Indian staff colleges for over 100 years. Indian, so Australian army officers served in India well before the Second World War. Um, there is a huge Indian diaspora in Australia. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a natural relationship there. We're both democracies. Uh, we both love cricket. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things we share that people may not uh, understand at, at first glance. Uh, the Quad is, is part of that relationship. You know, it's about free and open uh, Indo-Pacific. There are other elements of that relationship beyond defence uh, with the amount of Indian and Australian people who, who go between each other's countries every year uh, with education, uh, with trade. You know, the, India is a massive country. It's not just a country, it's a civilization um, with a very deep history of, uh, of lots of important parts of culture. And uh, it's a natural country that Australia would want to have a strong relationship with, I think. And by the way, uh, both our countries are washed by the Indian Ocean. Uh, we have a shared interest in a secure and open uh, Indian Pacific uh, and a secure and open Indian Ocean. Uh, and there's a lot of collaboration that goes on there between our navies and, and between our nations on that very issue. And moving to the European uh, Union uh, partners and institutions, uh, because as we know, um, in Europe, uh, the decision making process is a little bit more complicated as we have the European Union institutions on the one side and uh, also the European Union member states on the other side. Mm. Uh, so there has been already a discussion following the COVID-19 pandemic on how uh, to navigate between these uh, two major um, centers of power, so to say, on the one side, the traditional a transatlantic uh, partner, United States, but on the other side, the rising uh, economic power, China. Do you see COVID-19, uh, the pandemic, so to say, as a turning point for all significant uh, actors? So not just for uh, uh, European partners, but also for uh, Australia and other powers, let's say, in between to be faced with a kind of a either or choice at some point uh, in time. So basically trying to navigate uh, this uh, complex space between the two centers of, of power, but at some point being faced with uh, this either or decision. I think, you know, starting with the impact of COVID, I think uh, in the short term, it seems like it's accelerated change. Um, it certainly feels like that. But I think, too, that it's probably too early to tell. Um, but, you know, hi history is punctuated by these pulses of change. There's a great quote I love from George Orwell in 1942. He said, every now and then something happens. No doubt it's ultimately traceable to changes in industrial technique and the whole spirit and tempo of life changes and people acquire a new outlook. It feels like that's happening at the moment. You know, I think it's it's impacting on, you know, as we've already talked about supply chains, it's, it's, it's impacted how different countries relate to each other. Uh, Australia has never really uh, sought to make choices between countries. I mean, Austria doesn't make a choice between France and Germany. Um, you know, each country is important for different reasons. 
those relationships are important for different reasons. You know, and Australia is a very open and vocal supporter of a free and open Indo-Pacific and the rule of law um, and liberal democracies. Um, And that sometimes means we have strong affiliations with historical partners, but it also means we have strong affiliations with new partners who are are new democracies or newer democracies. So I don't think this is about choices between one big power or another. Um, It's all about making sure that we are part of ensuring that all of us have the chance to live a free and open and and open life able to make our own choices retain freedom of speech and those kind of things and and i think you know they're the kind of values that we share with the european union and all its members however there are also uh, regional actors with a different uh, view on the global order uh, basically uh, want you know, seeking to impose their own understanding, their own reading of mm-hmm. international norms, standards, and rules. And one such example is uh, this increasing systemic coordination between uh, China and Russia in key domains and fields of uh, international politics. Uh, so uh, what is your uh, take on uh, this uh, China-Russia systemic coordination? Mm-hmm. Is, is there actually a concrete impact impact by such actions or measures uh, that are being felt in the Indo-Pacific or are detrimental to Australia's uh, interests uh, in the long uh, run? And how will actually Australia contribute to counterbalancing this uh, increasing uh, presence uh, and power projection in the Indo-Pacific? Mm. Uh, it's it's fascinating to watch the China-Russia uh, relationship, right? Because it, it's kind of ahistorical, haven't always uh, gotten along very well. And indeed, they've, they've had a couple of stashes along their border at different times. Uh, but it is very interesting to watch for, for various reasons. You know, economically, there's certainly uh, energy relationships, uh, mineral exploitation, technological exchanges. I, I don't know that that's happening to the degree that some of the more negative and analysts are saying, but it's certainly happening, but I'm not sure to the degree that it is. Uh, integration of national security aspirations. I'm not sure that's happening to the degree some are speculating, you know, Russia is is more a European-oriented power. Uh, China is, a, is an Asia-oriented power. It's hard to reconcile those two sometimes. But there's definitely an interesting relationship there. Um, they're both thinking about uh, operating in the 21st century in a way that uh, many of the polities that grew up in the 19th and 20th centuries aren't. They have a different approach to information, uh, to influence, to uh, exerting that influence through non-military ways, but uh, involve the threat of force. Um, I, I find it fascinating to watch, and there's there's lessons there for us to learn about thinking about effectively uh, navigating your way as a nation in the 21st century. It doesn't mean we should be copying authoritarian regimes. I wouldn't ever suggest that. But they do view the world differently, and we should understand how they see the, the world if we're going to interact with them effectively. Because at the end of the day, that's what we want, right? We, we want to be able to work uh, with all nations. I know Australia does want us to be able to work with all nations effectively. It doesn't seek conflict. Uh, it certainly doesn't seek violent outcomes. It, it seeks uh, peaceful uh, economic and societal relations between countries. To do that, you've got to understand how others think. But it's hard. You know, We probably understand Russia a bit better than China. But China, like India, is a very old country and a very old civilization with a distinct view of the world. World. It has an amazingly deep, broad culture that is is wonderful. Quite frankly, uh, if you if you look into it, it has an amazing history. Um, CCP is a, a reasonably recent thing in China, and you need to always distinguish between the CCP and China um, because there are millions of Chinese people that live in all our countries who are wonderful citizens, great contributors to our nations. So, you know, we really need to understand that country. We understand its people better to to navigate um, the 21st century. Do you think that we are entering a new phase in uh, international relations uh, uh, phenomenon that uh, points uh, rather to a bifurcation of the global system rather than to the multipolarity as being outlined for at least the last 10, 15 years uh, following the unilateral phase of uh, the international system? Yeah, I mean, I'm not an IR expert. I don't have a doctorate in it or anything. There were people who were speculating that deglobalization was going on even before COVID, um, that, that you could start seeing the threads of it 
starting to occur. Um, certainly when it comes to technology, there is a greater difference between, say, China and some of its partners and, say, the US and Europe. You know, I, you can't disconnect from China, you can't disconnect from the EU, you can't disconnect from the US um, in a trade or economic sense. I, I, just, I just can't see that happening short of some major crisis. And I can't see why it would be desirable, to be quite frank. Uh, but certainly when it comes to outlooks on personal liberty, um, forms of governance, there does seem to be two worldviews. Um, the, the one we embrace, obviously, is about people are born with inalienable rights, freedom, liberty, fr freedom of expression. Uh, that's not the, the view of some countries. So I think this is an ideological difference that we're going to see play out over many decades. We've seen that before. This isn't the first time we've seen major differences in ideology. Um, and the real trick is staying connected whilst disagreeing in some of those approaches to how we live. We, we, we just can't disconnect. Um, we can't afford a world of two blocks that don't talk, don't interact, don't trade. Now, of any government that thinks that's in their interest or in the interest of global security, or in fact, our capacity to work collectively to respond to some of the really big issues, which include climate change. So for instance, you don't see a scenario in the future, let's say in the next 20, 30 years of an emergence of a, so to say, Cold War II, um, basically phase in international relations where uh, more or less, there will be two new blocks uh, with their supply chain networks and their, uh, so to say, alliances and partnerships, uh, of course, not being involved in a direct confrontation, uh, however, being more or less uh, separated uh, from each other. Um, you know, we are seeing pulling apart a little bit, particularly when it comes to technology, the Trans-Pacific Trade partnership uh, is an area that will be interesting. The US didn't join that, but China have now applied to join that. That'll be very interesting to see how that plays out. I don't have a strong view on that either way, but it will be fascinating to watch. I think if you do see that bifurcation and the split across all the different elements of uh, interaction between nations across economies, diplomacy, military relations, uh, societal links, I mean, I, I don't see that as a good thing. Uh, that's on the far end of one spectrum of possibilities, I think. It's possible. Uh, it's certainly possible. Uh, but I don't think that's the design that most countries seek. In fact, you saw President Biden today say we don't see a new Cold War. That's not in anyone's interests. Um, and even during the Cold War, which started the late 1940s and went through about 1991, um, there was always connectivity between the Soviet Union and the United States, whether it was collaboration and warning about exercises or agreements on uh, how they would act in the air or on the sea when there was contact between military forces, still went to Olympic Games together, there were cultural exchanges. So even if it was that worst end, there's still connectivity, it's in everyone's interest to stay connected. And as I said, you know, climate change is one of those challenges of the future that impacts on everyone. It's coming at us, every country has a role to play, but it's all about connected action and ideology is not going to matter in this one. It's all about action uh, and we've got to be connected and collaborative in doing that and bifurcation is not going to help. So to sum it up, basically there are fields of uh, cooperation that is uh, very much required uh, for the future of international relations, such as uh, the issues of climate change, but also uh, greening of economies, uh, the green resilience, so to say, uh, health uh, issues, pandemics, fighting future pandemics. Mm -hmm. However, uh, as seen from the point of geopolitics, what are, in your view, the lessons of uh, the pandemic, as well as uh, from the perspective of security and defense interests of the West? Do you expect a shift following the pandemic? Uh, let, just, let me just uh, stress that now NATO is uh, already increasingly dealing with uh, also with, uh, with, with China at the summits. So is there any uh, anticipation for a shift uh, in the way how the West uh, perceives uh, certain security and defense threats uh, and will pursue certain security and defense interests uh, in the future following the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, I mean, I think 
I mean, we all lived through 2020 uh, and watched on as pretty much every country kind of shut its borders and was every country for itself. Um, you know, and even even in the EU, that that happened, right? Different countries kind of closed down a little bit uh, to to one degree or another. Every country was slightly different in its settings, but you know, we saw how national sovereignty still matters. I think COVID's kind of brought that out. Um, you know, nation states still matter and. As important as multilateral organisations are, and they are very important, so are nation states, because nation states can bring different and diverse ideas to those multilateral organisations that are important. We've already talked about resilience and supply chain resilience. I think COVID's kind of brought out some of those issues. So, you know, I won't belabor that point, but it, it should be a lesson to every country, in particular strategists, policymakers and government leaders. You can still be surprised in the 21st century. And indeed, you might be surprised more often than you would like. Uh, surprise is one of those enduring themes of human existence, whether it's warfare or economics, don't matter. The pandemic uh, was largely a massive surprise. I mean, even a year before, you had health organisations saying we don't expect, you know, a pandemic in this time frame. Some predicted it, but not all. So I think nations should understand that, you know, uh, you can do all the planning you want. You can have all the best policy in the world and something can happen that can overturn that. How are you going to deal with surprises? The next surprise may not be a pandemic. It may be a climate shock. It could be an economic shock. Uh, how do we build societies that are resilient towards those shocks? How do we build governance models that can cope with them without automatically reverting to more authoritarian or, or closed border approaches they may not work in the future so you know for me it's the enduring lesson here out of COVID is we're still going to get surprised in the 21st century and we need to ensure that um, our governing models are able to cope, cope with those surprises but what would be the three particular security uh, risks of the future that will keep you awake in the night um no, there's a few. Uh, I think demography is a really interesting one. If you have a look at the last, you know, 240 years since the Industrial Revolution, as, as humans have industrialized in different societies, they've urbanized. Um, as they've urbanized, uh, both genders have got better educated and families have got smaller. Birth rates in most industrial countries now are well below replacement rates. Um, that's just the fact of what happens when people urbanize, get better education. Uh, it's more expensive to bring up kids in cities and these kind of things. So you're seeing populations in many countries aging uh, and declining. And indeed, I think the uh, UN projections for countries like China are for significant reductions in population by the end of the century. That's going to put a lot of stress on uh, certain models, whether it's um, workforce models, uh, whether it's how we care for the old. There's going to be a larger proportion of old people than there's ever been in human history. Uh, it's going to change how we house people. So demography is a significant one, and it's going to result in potential mass movement of people from different parts of the world to other other parts. That's one. Technology is obviously uh, interesting. That one doesn't worry me as much because we've been through it before. You know, people like Vaclav Smil have written about the impact of the second industrial revolution. Philip Blum's book, The Vertigo Years, looks at Europe in the 14 years in the lead up to World War I and, and the sense of bewilderment people felt at the pace of technological and societal change that was going on around them. Uh, so technology... Uh, I guess doesn't keep me awake, but it concerns me, not because we can do things, but not often enough do we ask ourselves, should we do this? And things like autonomous lethal systems. And I think the next big one in about a decade is going to be a biological augmentation of human beings and the ethics of doing that. Who should be augmented? Do you de-augment? Uh, is there going to be a haves and have not a human race because of it? So I think technology is the second big one. And then the, the third big one, and I think it's obvious, is, is climate change. You know, the, the IPCC reports only just come out in the last couple of months. It provides very compelling evidence from thousands of scientists around the world about the impacts of human beings on the macro climate of our world. We need to pay attention to that. And I'm not going to get into individual countries' politics on it. You know, it's hard to get two or three scientists to agree on anything. When you have thousands around the world uh, all agreeing that this is a thing and it's happening and it's and potentially some elements might be speeding up and some of it might be worse than we anticipated. Uh, that is a really serious challenge and that is going to change 
uh, how military organizations work because they're going to have to balance between war fighting and HADR kind of functions more than they might have expected before. It's going to change how humans move across the planet because some places will become unlivable, either because agriculture is no longer viable or because soil salinity goes up in small Pacific islands. So there's a range of different challenges related to climate change. They're already with us. You know, we're seeing longer uh, and worse bushfire seasons in Australia and in the United States now. So, you know, I think they're the big three for me, demographics, technology and climate change. Uh, speaking about uh, cons your concerns over, um, for instance, interference uh, through reproductive technologies, uh, the movie Gattaca came to my mind from the 90s, probably our younger audience uh, does not kn does not know it, but it's it's been a really great movie with Ethan Hawke and Uma Thurman. And I can only recommend it uh, because it really deals with the possible consequences of such technologies for mm. uh, for the society. And uh, now I would like also to move uh, to um, to to your upcoming book. Uh, so in February next uh, year, we are expecting uh, your first book, War Transformed, the future of 21st century great power competition and conflict. Would you mm. like to reveal uh, some details uh, from your book um, to our audience so that uh, we also know what it is about, what is uh, your approach and why we uh, actually, why we should buy the book? Well, it, it's a book fundamentally uh, about human organizations and what drives them to change. It, it really starts off with a quick survey of um, change since the first industrial revolution and how since the first industrial revolution, industrial change has driven societal change, which has driven change in military organizations and how military organizations think and fight. Mm -hmm. If you roll forward to the current era, uh, what some are calling the fourth industrial revolution, it's the confluence, I think, of uh, several large macro changes, technology, uh, geopolitics, uh, demography, and, and climate change is in there. And they're all interacting, they're all impacting on each other. You can, you can break them out as separate drivers, but they're all interacting with each other. Uh, and it's getting more and more complex to really select just one of those lines. So the core idea, uh, after we have a look at that current environment, those big trends, is that despite you know, the big changes in technology, and that's where people seem to go when they want to talk about change. It's actually going to be the combination of new ideas, different organizations, and developing our people that will provide um, military organizations, but frankly, any kind of organization, an advantage in the 21st century. So I look at what does the 21st century demand in the way of new ideas, how we think not just about conflict, but about how we organize military organizations. Um, but at heart, and this is the second last chapter, it's about people. How do we think about developing our people? How do we make them more technologically literate? How do we make them better connected? Um, how do we ensure they're able to learn across their whole lifetime so they can keep up with the pace of change? Uh, and then I finish the book with some propositions about what I think will be the keys to success for military organizations in the 21st century. You have to read the book to see what they are, but that's that's the book in a nutshell. It's, it's not designed to be a thousand pages of dense academic writing. Uh, it's about 280 pages. I think it's written in plain English, but as a military officer, you'd never quite know. I'll leave, I'll leave you to, to judge that. But it's it's designed not just for a military audience, I mean, if you are running a large corporation, you could read this and new ideas, new organizations and better developing your people can equally be the keys to generating advantage in whatever industry you, you are part of. So, um, yeah, it's for military people, but I, I hope it has a wider audience than that, because I think there's a lot of pragmatic and common sense ideas in there. Uh, maybe. Just a short question, uh, still uh, related to the book. Uh, of course, we do not want to hear many spoilers. Uh, that is clear. But do you see a shift in the way how warfare is going 
to look like uh, in the 21st uh, century? Maybe really with a short, uh, only short uh, answer without revealing too much. <laughs> but yeah. I think this is going to be very interesting also in a sense uh, for non-military people, um, mm -hmm. in a sense that uh, we are already observing a great uh, shift. Uh, um, we have already US Space Force and uh, supposedly other um, other you know militaries are going to um, mm -hmm. you know think more in that dimension there is also the yeah. dimension of cyber security so obviously the military is uh, you know occupying new spaces new dimensions and uh, i think that uh, this is also going to be part of the 21st century great power competition mm -hmm. right yeah um uh, you know, military uh, scholars, I mean, all the way back from Clausewitz onwards, talk about the changing character of war and the enduring nature of war. And the changing character is, you know, what we fight with, where we fight, um, and, and how we fight uh, with what tools. And that is clearly changing. I mean, it's changed ever since the first Neanderthal picked up a rock and threw it at his mate. And that, that's just going to be an ongoing part of, of uh, human uh, existence. Uh, you know, I, I won't get into a conversation about is it nature or nurture, uh, but, you know, competition is part of every living thing's existence. So is the character war changing? Absolutely. Whether it's uh, a greater emphasis on influence, space operations, cyber, um, there's, a, there's innumerable things where it is changing. The other bit, the enduring nature, and this is an epilogue in the book and I get into it, is, is the enduring nature, and that is the, the interplay of human will, um, the purpose of war, is that changing? Uh, that is a really good philosophical argument um, because at the end of the day, no matter how far up the decision change or autonomous systems go, it's ultimately humans who make the policy and make the decisions to go to war or miscalculate and go to war. So I don't see the nature, that very human interplay that is uh, integral to warfare, to conflict, to competition. I don't, I don't see that changing anytime soon, regardless of the significant disruptions in technological means that we're seeing come down the track. And I still want to stay with you for a little bit longer in the field of uh, books and reading because mm -hmm. uh, you are an avid reader. You have been posting these amazing reading lists. Uh, and uh, maybe I was thinking it will be great also if you can uh, make some recommendations uh, as uh, you did in the past. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, I think the Modern War Institute has been publishing your reading lists uh, and you've also pointed to uh, Einstein's quote uh, who once said, I have no special talent, only that I'm passionately passionately curious. And I think mm -hmm. right now we are also in a situation <laughs> in a similar situation of, uh, you know, of two people being passionately curious. So I'm really curious about your uh, further books recommendations. What are you currently reading? I mean, given that your book has been already published and is actually mm -hmm. not only awaiting to be, to be out on the market, what could you recommend us in a sense that uh, it's obviously not only about your interests in mm. uh, the classic sphere of uh, warfare and you know military issues, but you are uh, have, you have uh, quite of a, a diverse um, booking list, I suppose. Uh, yeah, I love reading. I, um, as I say to people, read like your life depends on it, because it might. Um, you know, I think uh, a great book by Frank Hoffman that's just come out called Mars Adapting, which is about adaptation, uh, which is probably the most important uh, characteristic that any organisation can have is the ability to recognise the need to change and, and move, more, move quickly. Um, so that, that's, that's a really important book, I think. Um, and there's been a couple other books by Dave Barno and Nora Benchal on a, on a similar topic on adaptation. Um, Martin Dempsey's book, No Time for Spectators, is a fabulous examination of leadership. Now, I'll be upfront. I work for General Dempsey in Iraq. Uh, he is the real deal as the finest leader I've ever seen anywhere uh, in any situation in my entire life. And that is, that is a, a really uh, magnificent book. Um, uh, there's a bunch of others out there. Um, the US Marine Corps just published a very short piece of doctrine called Competing. It's fabulous. 
uh, in this era of collaboration and collegiality, uh, it's a really good book that says this, yeah, you've got to be able to work with each other. You've got to be self-aware and all that stuff, but you've also got to be a competitor. And what does that mean for a military organisation and a nation? So that, you know, that's pretty important. And I guess the final one I'd, I'd recommend is, there's a great book I've been reading about uh, time at the moment. I'll just, uh, I'm just trying to, find the name of it here uh it really is a is a fabulous book and it's called wartime and it's it features chapters by a group of scholars uh, mainly from uh europe and the united kingdom that looks at how does the impact of time change policy development strategy and military operations in the 21st century it is a terrific book and it's from a range of different IR scholars uh, and other experts. And um, boy, some very, very fine insights in there. But yeah, I put out a reading list every year. Uh, it's not just books, it's podcasts, it's Twitter feeds, it's journals, um, it's uh, websites. Um, and I'm a big advocate of this professional military education global ecosystem that now has come into existence over the last 20 years with these dozens and dozens of blogs and, and sites connected through lots of different countries where we're sharing information, we're teaching each other, um, and it forms the informal part of our education to complement a formal education we get from universities and, and military colleges. And since you mentioned that, uh, please uh, make sure to, to follow War in the Future uh, on Twitter. So the Twitter account is War in the Future. Uh, and you can find all this information there. And also you can reach out uh, to General Ryan and ask also about uh, book recommendations, lists and so on. It's really fascinating. I mean, even these recommendations uh, already have saved us until Christmas time. But since you mentioned, since you mentioned Iran, I'm really, I really feel inclined to ask you a final question, and mm -hmm. that is uh, regarding Afghanistan, because you've been also to Afghanistan. Do you think that uh, there might be a role for the Quad uh, following the takeover of the Taliban, and you know, potential, you know, Afghanistan's collapse uh, in the future, uh, basically to uh, somehow counterbalance uh, these uh, ramifications in the Indo-Pacific region, of course with a role for Australia, but in a broader sense, maybe that could be one way how European partners, including France, might uh, actually uh, join uh, the Quad or participate more actively. And this would be also in accordance with this new uh, European Indo-Pacific strategy. What would be your take on that? That's, very, that's a big question. <laughs> very big question, I know. Well, that, 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 <laughs> it's a very meaty question. Um, yeah, you know, with Afghanistan, I mean, uh, it was just awful to watch the, you know, the final days and, and weeks there. I mean, for the hundreds of thousands, you know, uh, of US, European, Australian, New Zealand, Canadians and others who've served and sacrificed there um, and had a lot of, friends and, and partners there, it was, was agonizing to watch. Um, you know, and, and I think notwithstanding the eventual outcome, uh, we, I think it says a lot good about our nations, yours, mine, and, and many others. So for 20 years, we tried and worked hard to give the Afghan people, people a better life. Um, I don't know what every country's policy is going to be towards Afghanistan and the Taliban government herein. But I know uh, none of us have an interest in it returning to where it was 20 years ago. Uh, we have an interest in ensuring that the gains in things like women's rights and, and uh, education for both men and, and women, and particularly young girls, should continue. And I see the Taliban's announced that young girls will be allowed to go back to school uh, just recently. So, you know, if, for me, my, my sense is there'll be a level of engagement to uh, encourage that kind of behaviour, but what the detailed policies from different countries will be, I'm not sure. Uh, the Quad, you know, I, I think there's lots of things the Quad can do. What it's going to do uh, will be up to the four leaders of those countries. I think they're meeting again shortly. Uh, it's another one of 
those uh, collectives of like-minded nations who seek certain outcomes in, in different parts of the world. I think that's really important. Um, but, you know, the, the EU's new Indo-Pacific strategy is really important. I think the, our Prime Minister in New York today said, we are very keen to see the EU and all the nations of Europe participating uh, in the various strands of Indo-Pacific life through economy, society, uh, uh, military, uh, a whole range of ways that the EU can uh, play a role in the Indo-Pacific. Um, so, you know, I think that strategy coming out is a very positive step. Um, Australia loves working with a whole range of different countries from all over the world in the Indo-Pacific and in our own region, and we'll continue to do that. General Ryan, thank you very much for joining me on this journey uh, from Europe to Australia and back. We covered many exciting issues. Please follow General Ryan at War in the Future. Uh, that is the account on Twitter. Then you will find also more information about all other exciting activities uh, and uh, interests he has. And don't forget February 2022, War Transformed. We are very much looking forward to your first book. And I'm quite sure that is going to be only the first of many, many books to come. Thank you very much. I hope so. And, and thank you so much for your time. It's been a wonderful conversation. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Bharat Varta podcast. If you want to see more content like this, then don't forget to subscribe to our channel. We started Bharat Varta to facilitate long form discussions on politics, policy, and culture. We don't necessarily endorse anything that was said in this episode. If you wish to offer us feedback, do reach out to us on social media. We are at Bharatvartha on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You could also get in touch with us on our website, www.bharatvartha.in. The links are in the description below. Until next time, stay safe, take care, and jai.